In the last few episodes of this series, we looked at the development of vertebrates as we discussed the evolution of the heart, lungs, eyes, spinal cord, and skeletal features like the skull, jaws, arms, shoulders, and so on. Our study of what we colloquially refer to as fish went from the Cambrian through the Ordovician and Silurian and into the Devonian, where we still are now and will be for the rest of this video. Most of those other clades of weird fish that we mentioned before still existed by then, including a lot of the jawless ones. But it wasn't just the oceans that were full of these oddities. The lineage of fish that we're most interested in now have moved into freshwater rivers and lakes. That's a much different environment than along the seashore. The waters are calmer with no pounding surf, which offers an obvious advantage for any small animals wanting to take a breather from swimming. Remember, there wasn't a lot happening on the land yet. There wasn't that much diversity among plants at that time, and the only terrestrial animals were a few arthropods, including the very first insects. So the shallow water wouldn't have been as dangerous to fish as it would be today because there weren't any animals on land big enough to do any fishing. So if you traveled back in time to the Devonian period, but away from the seas with the giant placoderms and nautiloids to the relative safety of inland lakes and rivers, what sort of wildlife could you expect to find? Not much on land, apart from some alarmingly large scorpions and such, but there was plenty of life in the waterways. In the last video, we mentioned Eustinopteron. They could be found in salt or fresh water far upstream. They were as big as you are and probably as dangerous as a barracuda. Then there's Hyneria, which looks very similar, but it was nine feet long with stabbing fangs. This was a freshwater fish, but it was easily big enough to eat you. So let's move away from the big waterways and into the wetlands, where the depth varies and is usually shallow, but some areas may dry out completely in certain seasons. Even today, some of the fish who live in these type areas will crawl or drag themselves from one body of water to another, like walking catfish and snakeheads and that sort of thing. This is both the advantage and the curse of living in a freshwater environment. So it was easy for me to imagine Devonian fish pulling themselves along by their lobed fins and just getting progressively better at that, especially since they already had lungs and could breathe the air. So I remember thinking that maybe their legs just kept getting stronger over many generations. There was never a time when I didn't understand or accept evolution, but when I was a boy, they hadn't yet discovered many transitional species, so my understanding was based on taxonomy instead, which is the subject of this series. So when creationists jeered me that we'd never found a walking fish or a fish with feet, I had to humbly concede that no, we hadn't. Not yet. Only, they didn't understand that I already had enough evidence to prove my point even without that. Of course there are walking fish and even fish with legs and feet and even toes, but the ones we have now developed differently and aren't part of the lineage that we're talking about. We're looking for some with very specific traits. This episode features a number of transitional species being apparently intermediate between different evolutionary stages, meaning that it has some characteristics of parent group A, some characteristics of, of daughter group B, and probably some characteristics partway between the two. Ideally, the transitional fossils should be found stratigraphically between the first occurrence of the ancestral lineage and the first occurrence of the descendant lineage. In previous episodes, I've already shown you several transitional species, but of all the evolutionary intermediates we could ever hope to see, there could hardly be a more dramatic transition than from sea to land. And there's not just one of these intermediate species, there are several steps up that stairway. In the last few decades, there has been a paleontological boon filling so many gaps in the evolutionary chain that there's hardly any links still missing anymore. As I said in the last video, once we started finding those transitions, which creationists insisted we would never find, but which you're about to see, it turned out the fish didn't come out of the water and then learn to walk like I once thought they did. Instead, they perfected walking before they ever ventured onto land. For example, look at Cerypterus, a rhizodont very close to our own ancestral lineage. The shape of this fish isn't what's important, it's the configuration of the bones in its pectoral fins. It has the same bones we do. The humerus, ulna, radius, they're just shaped differently. All these other fish are the same way. Here's the fin of Eustinopteron, which again has the same bones, just shaped differently. These fish evidently used their fins as feet, not to walk on, but perhaps just to hold themselves in place against the current. Eustinopteron is part of a clade of Eotetrapodomorpha, which essentially means stem tetrapods, or what tetrapods came from. If you don't know what a tetrapod is, it's a four-legged vertebrate that is skeletally adapted for life on dry land. Stem tetrapods consist of two groups, including Tristocopteridae, like Eustinopteron, which turned out to be close to, but not quite the transition that we once thought it could be. We've since found a closer match. 
The other group of stem tetrapods is Elpistus degalia. This begins a gray area of what used to look like fish but that don't look so fishy anymore. These are also called fish tetrapods or fishipods. And they begin with Pendericthus. Note that Pendericthus has lost its dorsal fin and all its fins except for the paired pectoral and pelvic fins. Their pectoral fins are connected to his shoulder, as we discussed in the previous video, and their pelvic fins are actually connected to each other through a rudimentary pelvis that is not connected to anything else. Although the hind fins are consequently a bit small and weak, it already looks a bit like a four-legged amphibian. Is it a fish? <laughs> it still has internal gills and scales and so on. Now we move on to Stegocephalia, and this is an important clip. It is the group of four-limbed eotetrapodomorphs that have lost at least their bony gill covers, although some may still have soft ones, and they have a rib anchoring their now better developed pelvis to their spine. I illustrated this with my sculpture of Elgin Erpeton showing how the hind fins are now as functional as the forelimbs. And the best example of this is Tiktaalik, which had a robust pelvis showing that the hind limbs were as strong as the front limbs too. And this fish had a neck, which fish never have. It also had elbows and wrists and the very beginnings of fingers within its fin rays. Because it turns out that the same cells that make fin rays also make fingers. This was a discovery in the field of Evo Devo, matching evolutionary development with embryological development. Freshwater rivers and streams are often littered with debris from fallen trees, or in this case, fallen ferns. So there are lots of hiding places, unlike the vast open areas of the ocean floor. And fins are fine for swimming, but these animals found themselves climbing through the bracken, or they were ambush predators sitting motionless, unnoticed, and suddenly darting forward. In either case, fingers could dig in where fins could not, and thus there was a selective pressure to replace fin rays with fingers. So we jump ahead to Acanthostega. This is my favorite of all transitional species ever. Better than Lucy, better than Archie. Because Acanthostega is a real-life representation of the Darwin fish. It is a fish. It still has internal gill bars and fin rays on its tail like a fish, but it's also a four-legged walking tetrapod with primitive wrists and elbows and the ear bones of a tetrapod too. It also had eight toes on each foot. It still wasn't suited to walking on dry land though. For that we need the next phase of this transition, ichthyostega. Here are the interesting transitions between the two. Ichthyostega still had bony fin rays in its tail as acanthostega did also, though they're a bit reduced. But it doesn't have internal gills anymore. Without a gill cover or internal gill bars to hold them in place, it may have had distended gill fronds like the modern axolotl or tiger salamander larvae. Remember how evolutionary development parallels embryological development. Human embryos temporarily have these pharyngeal pouches which are morphologically indistinguishable from the gill slits in modern fish embryos, and the divergence of development from there matches what is indicated in the fossil record. In fishes, these pharyngeal slits become gills. In tetrapods, they become the thymus, tonsils, and parts of the ears. Which may explain why some people have an atavism of having a tiny hole just at the beginning of the ear. That may be a remnant of that old gill opening. Ichthyostega still wasn't adequately suited for living on land, but it was close enough to crawl out for a short while. Most interestingly, Ichthyostega had seven toes on each foot, but three of those toes seem to be nearly fused into a single thumb making an image that uh, is as familiar as the back of your hand, and which subsequent forms continued. So, assuming that you've already shrugged your shoulders and accepted your classification as a tetrapodomorph, do you accept that having no dorsal fin, that you're also Elpistosteglian? And do you understand that having no gill covers, but having four limbs with wrists and elbows and fingers and a pelvis connected to your spine, that all of this means that you're Stegocephalian?